Hey there, whether you're part of our church family or a friend tuning in, we love that you are here and pray that you might hear from God today. It is our joy to be able to provide access to teaching, worship, and other resources to equip and train the Church of Jesus. And while we are encouraged for you to benefit from these resources, we ask that they are only supplemental and no way replace a commitment to a gathering and learning within a local church. These resources are gifts of God's grace for people to grow with, but are never meant to replace our belonging to a covenant community of faith. If you'd like to learn more about Center Grove and what we're up to, head to cglife.org and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Center Grove. And if you'd like to reach out, just simply email info at cglife.org. Now, we pray that God stirs in your heart as you listen to the proclamation of His Word. Morning, Center Grove Church. It is great to see you all. As always, my name is Seth Brown. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Center Grove. Dr. Kortz will be back with us next week as we head into Palm Sunday already. It's pretty amazing to think we're almost almost at Easter. And you've already heard from Nathan, if you're here at the beginning of the service, our goal with really the month of March is to help prepare you for Easter with a new song we just sang with resources out in the lobby as you leave today to grab that will help you build your family, but there's also resources, of course, for individuals uh, to build up your own heart and strengthen the Lord. And then, of course, the collection we're taking for the Baptist Children's Homes and their efforts to bless families. So there's lots going on. It's great to see you, and I really can't believe we're almost at Easter. As you've already seen, you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Psalm 96. I'm gonna meet you there in just a few moments. Uh, We've been in a series called Know Your God, where our goal has been to examine book four of the Psalm book, which is Psalms 90 through 106. And uh, our goal is simple, is we want to know God more so that we can love him more. And last week, we talked about what what it means to look at God's majesty or his kingliness, you could say, and how our response to God as king is worship. And how worship is simply to sing, to bow, and to listen. And in Psalm 96, we're gonna look at some similar themes that I'll mention in just a few moments. But I think what helps us as we continue in this series is to understand that the book of Psalms, these are songs that tell a story. They're not just isolated songs that were just haphazardly smacked into the middle of your Bible. These are songs that tell a story. And in this section of the Psalms, the story they are trying to tell is the story of God as king. You know, we humans, we live, our lives are directed by the stories that we believe. And you see this really, really clearly in the lives of children. You know, my kids, who I talk about uh, very frequently because they're still at the age where I can use them in sermons and they don't get mad at me. So in a couple of years, we'll, we'll tone that down a little bit. But whatever content they're consuming will dictate the type of imaginary play they do. So if they're watching a movie about animals, they pretend to be animals. If they watch a movie about, you know, yesterday we watched a movie called Wreck-It Ralph. It's a really, you know, fun one, a little over 10 years old. Uh, So they act like the characters in that movie. And adults kind of do the same thing. We just don't do it in imaginary ways. We pretty much believe these stories that oftentimes are fed to us through media, through social media, through our own past experiences, and then our lives are directed based on the stories that we believe. So what the Psalms help us do is to look at the true story in this world that God is king, and that he's actually bringing redemption to a world that is broken. And if you can reorient your life to actually believe that God is king, it's gonna change everything about your existence, I can promise you that. And the simple response to God being king is worship, as we talked about last week. And so today, we're gonna talk about that from a little bit of a different angle that our psalm mentions, as you might have already noticed during the reading. We're gonna look at the idea that our response to God as king is to fear him. And the key here is understanding what that actually means, which we'll explain, but also to understand that if you learn to cultivate a fear of God now, then you actually won't be fearful at his coming. You'll be able to shout with all creation and be joyful and exult as the psalm says. So really, we're gonna look at three things as we look at Psalm 96. We're gonna look at the king's glory. 
We're gonna look at the king's due, what we give back to him, and we're gonna look at the king's coming. The king's glory, the king's due, and the king's coming. So let's dive in, let's start in verse one and look at the king's glory. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. You know, this is a familiar intro to the Psalms. I thought it was really fitting today that we sang a new song, and then, of course, our psalm begins by saying, sing to the Lord a new song. And really this idea, like Roman mentioned, I thought that was a, a great way he put it, singing the Lord a new song is oftentimes more for us. It refreshes our hearts. And we don't sing to God a new song because he gets tired of the old songs we sing. In fact, in his throne room right now, there are angels singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and they'll be doing that forever. We sing to the Lord a new song because God is constantly doing new things all around us. And when we sing a new song, we're actually taking notice of what he's doing around us. And honestly, the application for us here today, because uh, if you're like me, you're probably not a songwriter. I don't have the creative gene at all, so I don't do some of that creative stuff. But what I can do is I can notice God's new works in my life and, the, and in the lives of those around me. You know, I didn't come up with this, but it's been said before, uh, you can't live today off of yesterday's quiet time. We do need to remember God's past salvation and his past works in our lives. That's clearly evident in the, when you read through the scriptures. But what we also need is day-to-day -day communion with God and a refreshing on what he is doing in our own lives. If you're married, you probably look back on your wedding day and you look at pictures and it's joyful and it's sweet and it's encouraging, but the day-to-day -day function of your marriage is not based on thinking about your wedding day. It requires fresh acts of love and goodness towards one another each and every day. And so it is in our relationship with God. Now in Psalm 96, what's interesting is one of the reasons that we are told that we sing a new song is because of the surprising audience that's mentioned. This is, might be lost on us, but if you remember, the Psalms is a song book written specifically for Israel, and lots of the Psalms are directed right at Israel. And in fact, many of them talk about Israel and Israel's God compared to the nation's false gods that they worship. And it talks about how God is going to bring justice against nations that have brought destruction in God's good world. This psalm is a little bit different. This psalm is for all the earth. It says, hey, all you peoples, all the earth, sing a new song. And you know, this may not, this may not, hits you between the eyes, but it would have hit uh, an ancient Israelite in between the eyes. Because throughout the Old Testament, Israel's job, they were chosen by God to be priests to the whole world, but they kept forgetting that that was their job. And they thought that the blessings of God were supposed to terminate on them. But God blessed them so that they could be a blessing to others, and this psalm is a reminder of that. And so the audience is surprising. The audience is all the earth should do the things that are mentioned in this psalm. And then we see here the, the key word. We're gonna take a closer look at the king's glory as we read verse three when it says, declare his glory among the what? Nations, that's our audience. His marvelous works among all the peoples. A glory is a a really churchy, biblical word that sometimes we hear so much that we don't understand what it means. Glory very literally means weighty or heavy. And God's glory, his weightiness, his importance is on display in the fact that he creates everything. He's made everything. He is the most important, the most weighty being to exist. So the psalm is saying, declare his great power and importance. And what this tells us, if you've been paying close attention throughout the series, almost every single psalm mentions God's greatness or God's power. It mentions his greatness and it mentions his goodness. And if you wanna have any sort of meaningful life with God, the, fund the, the fundamental belief that you must have is that God is both great and good. And you'll hear that said multiple times throughout this series because it is so important. We so easily, when you have doubts, when you have struggles, I can guarantee you either are either, you are either doubting God's greatness, his power, 
or you are doubting God's goodness, his character, to do the right thing. Any sort of issue you have with God comes down to you doubting his greatness or doubting his goodness. And the Psalms remind us that he is both and we must accept him as both if we wanna have a meaningful and vibrant life with God. But now, verses four through six is kind of the, the, key, the, the key thing we need to focus on in terms of how we respond to God in worship because we've seen that he's glorious. We've seen this is for all the peoples and then it, we're gonna learn how actually, th- what this should do within us as we understand it greater. Verse four, it says, for great or powerful is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Again, we're gonna mention God's greatness throughout this series because it is that important to understand. And it's very clear the point that the author's making is that because God is great, we should fear him and we should praise him. Because God is great, we should fear him and we should praise him. And so fear of God is actually a worshipful response to him. But let's make something abundantly clear because some of us, I bet you every single person has heard this phrase, fear of God, but it's really easy to misunderstand what this actually means. So we gotta have a clear understanding of this because our Bible talks about this all the time. And honestly, many of us, if you're like me, uh, you might mistakenly equate the fear of God with this idea that means you should be scared of him and run away from him like you would a snake. And the fear of God in the Bible, for those who trust him and believe him, is not at all supposed to be a fear that leads us to run away from him. It's actually supposed to be a fear that leads us to run to him. Notice in the next section of verses, which we'll dive into in greater detail, verses seven through nine, what does it tell us to do? It says, come into his courts, come into his presence. It doesn't say, run away from him. It says, draw near to him. This is a fear that draws us in. If the fear of God is not a fear that leads us to, to fight, to flight, or to freeze. It's a fear that leads us to draw near to him. You know, this is, uh, I heard this story a while ago about a fella who was interviewing uh, for a, actually a pastoral position at a church. And he was uh, interviewing and things seemed to be going well and he was asked the question, what is your greatest fear? So the ball is on the tee for him to reveal his greatest priorities in ministry, to reveal the things that he wants to focus on and to reveal the things that kind of keep him up at night that would make him a good pastor because he cares about the right things. Uh, But his response to the question, what's your greatest fear, was snakes. Now, I will say, that's not a terrible answer when it comes to fears. But the point of that question was not what type of thing makes you want to fight, flight, or freeze. The point of that question was what do you care most deeply about? What means the most to you? What has the most power in your life? What is the highest priority for you? And so we can't see the fear of God as just like a fear of snakes or insert whatever fear you have Katie and I were kind of joking yesterday and she started Googling different phobias that people have, which you can be scared of anything according to the internet. Um, But the funniest one that we found was, uh, I don't remember what it was called, but there's there's a a fear of teenagers. (laughs) And uh, it kind of insinuated, you know, all adults on some level fear teenagers a little bit. But if you spend more time with teenagers, you, you know, this could actually help you deal with this a little bit better. Uh, so I thought that was funny, but that's not what the fear of God is all about. The fear of God is really about two things when it comes down to it. These two things uh, might seem to compete, but they're very related. The fear of God is about understanding that God is the highest power and placing God as the highest priority. The fear of God is about understanding him as the highest power and placing him as the highest priority. Because the reality is, guys, the fear of God does involve us placing him as the highest priority, 
But the Bible also does describe a God who is fearsome because of his sheer holiness, his power, his might, his glory. If you were to encounter his presence right now, if you were to enter into his throne room right now, you would be the best type of afraid. You would be awestruck. Whenever you read through the Old Testament, you'll see some occurrences where prophets or people will have this really amazing experience with God and they think they're gonna die because they're in awe of his sheer glory. So there is this element that is described here in the text that God is powerful, he's the most powerful thing to exist, and so naturally that would make you afraid if you were in his presence. But the thing that makes God different than the fear of like a snake or another type of animal is that God is good. God is good. So understanding God as most powerful does produce a fear of God in us. You know, a really cool example in the scriptures, you guys probably know this story, even if you're not super familiar with the Bible, you've heard it somewhere before. But there's a story where Jesus is on the boat with his disciples, and there's a great storm, and Jesus, of all things, is sleeping. It's pretty awesome. I wish I could have that type of ability to sleep. I can't sleep in a car, an airplane, I'm a terrible traveler. But Jesus can sleep in the open sea in the middle of a storm, which is pretty cool. So Jesus is asleep, There's this storm that is fearsome and terrible. The disciples are afraid for their life because they know how dangerous being stuck on a boat in the first century in the middle of a storm is. So they wake Jesus up and they say, Jesus, aren't you going to do anything? We are dying. And Jesus wakes up. He tells the storm to be quiet. And everything is calm. So what do you think happens next? What happens next is very interesting. Is the disciples went from fearing the storm to fearing Jesus. After the storm calms, literally the text says, they were greatly afraid and they asked, who then is this that even the storms obey him? So this is the type of fear that understands what you're dealing with, understands God's power. And I've said this before, it's a quote that I think is very helpful. Dallas Willard said, God is not mean, but he is dangerous. If you deal with electricity, if you deal with something, if you were out on the open ocean, if you were dealing with something that was dangerous, you would be careful because you understand its power. So there is this fear that happens within us when we actually have an understanding of God's power, and that is healthy. Again, that's not a fear that makes you run away from him because God's goodness makes us want to draw near. He is the source of all life, so we can fear him and know his power and still wish to draw near to him. And this is the point that Psalm 96 makes. It says, the Lord, we fear him because why? The Lord made the heavens. Very simple. Who made the heavens? The Lord. The idols we make with our hands made nothing. We made them. And that's kind of the point of the next verse that we'll dive into in just a second. So fearing God is about understanding his power and believing it. But the fear of God in the Bible is also about what we prioritize. It's about what we value most. We fear things that we prioritize. Still example, if you fear being late, what do you do? You will prioritize certain habits and certain things in your life where you won't be late. If you're married, you can't really control your spouse. They're probably, you pro- if you are married and you're the type of person who, if you're, if you're on time, you're late. If you're five minutes early, you're on time. If you're that type of person, uh, you married somebody who is scared to be the first one to arrive at anything. And so they'll arrive late. But if you fear being late, you're going to do things that, help you prioritize showing up on time. What you fear is what you prioritize. Your fears reveal what you think is powerful and they reveal what you care about. They reveal what you care about. And verse five helps kind of make that point when it says, for we fear God above all gods, little g gods, which means they're fake, for all the gods of the people are what? Worthless idols worthless idols. Now, here's the deal. You probably know how this works, or you can assume by the context, but in this period of history, the foreign nations literally would create things with their hands and worship them. They're uh, idols made of wood or stone, and they would bring offerings to these idols. They would worship them. And I can, I would bet you probably don't struggle with 
literal idolatry. Uh, but I would say, like the foreign nations and like me, uh, our issue and the issue the author is calling out is that we fear things in creation more than we fear the creator. We fear things in creation more than we fear the creator. And if you wanna be the type of person who cultivates a fear of God in your life, you've got to be honest about the things in your life, the created things in your life, that you tend to fear more than God. You guys know what they are. I'm a people pleaser, I fear people's approval. I fear doing poorly at work, so I'm going to prioritize work. I fear losing control of my life or losing power in my life, so I'm gonna try to control and manipulate my environment and the people around me. We all have these things in our lives that we fear, things in creation, and that leads us to fail to fear the creator. So basically what the author's calling out here is that the nations in this time in Israel's history, they would ascribe power to powerless things. And I think we all know we do the same thing. We sometimes ascribe power to powerless things. You know, one of the things that we try to tell our daughters a lot, especially the ones that more have the tendency towards people pleasing, and this could be convicting for us to say because we're gonna struggle with the same thing at times, is if one of them is upset about something a kid said at school or something that happened, we try to remind them, you know, what God says about you is more important than what somebody else says about you. But you know, you never fully outgrow that desire to want to be liked, to want to be approved of, and you've constantly got to, if you wanted to cultivate a fear of God, develop this mindset where actually what God says I really do believe is more important than what other people say. My job is to be faithful, not to be liked. That doesn't mean you are mean <laughs> and you say, I don't care to be liked. It just simply means that we care more about what God thinks than what we think. So our problem, the greatest obstacle that prevents you from cultivating a fear of God is a misaligned fear, is fearing the wrong things. Another silly example, our dog is not gonna win any awards for intelligence. <laughs> and it's a little eight pound dog, very, very manly. And uh, she is, uh, she's very afraid of flies for some reason. So when flies are in our house, she hears the buzzing and she's like terrified, she cowers down, she hides. But she's not afraid of fire. So if we have a fire in our backyard, which we do pretty regularly, then she will just get dangerously close to the fire as if nothing's wrong and clearly she's heating up. Like I don't know how she doesn't feel it but she gets so close to the fire so frequently that we most of the time have to just put her inside. That's called fearing the wrong things and it's silly for my dog to do that, but if I'm honest and if you're honest, we do the same thing in other ways. Again, if you go back to what people think of you, we fear what a finite person thinks of us sometimes more than we fear what an infinite God thinks of us. And it can control our lives and it can misalign our lives and it leads to disorder in all of these places. And so we've got to learn to have God as our greatest fear and then all of our other fears will start to align in the right place. Our misplaced fears will lead to disordered lives because what fear does is fear causes you to narrow your focus on one thing at the expense of other things. That's what fear does. So if you go back to the snakes example, I'm kind of mixing metaphors here, but hopefully you'll understand and this will be helpful. If you did encounter a snake and you are afraid of snakes, you are thinking about dealing with the snake. You're not thinking about the bills you haven't paid yet, are you? Fear will narrow your focus on dealing with one thing. And this is what, you know, anxiety is a form of fear. And that's why if you do have a more anxious personality and you have this ruminating loop in your mind, it causes you to focus on one thing at the expense of all of these other things. So fear will narrow your focus, and if you fear anything that is less than God, you're going to have a life that is disordered in terms of your fears. Again, the other, I mean, the examples are endless, you probably see these coming. And Dr. Kors said this last week beautifully, I thought, but when 
Your greatest fear is how you do at work. You will prioritize work at the expense of your family oftentimes. So you'll narrow your focus in one area and then you'll neglect the other area. But the key is, if you make God your greatest fear, if you cultivate that in your life, and your greatest fear is the greatest thing in existence, then all of your other fears actually fall into their proper order and you can deal with them in an appropriate way. That's the beautiful thing. That's what Jesus means in Matthew 6, when he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then what? All of these things will be added to you. All the things you're afraid of, whether or not you'll have clothes, whether or not you'll have food, all of these things will be added to you if God is your greatest fear. The fear of God is about power, Who's the highest power? It's about priority. Who's the highest priority? And the point here is that this king, God, is glorious. He's worthy of our fear. And when that's where our fear is directed, everything else falls into place. So let's keep reading. And so we've looked at the, the king's glory. Now we're gonna look at the king's due, what we actually give back to him. We've talked about fear as our response to him in worship. But what does this actually look like? when we fear him and see him as glorious. Well, like, pick up with me in verse seven through nine here. It says this. We're looking at the king's due. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Again, here's fear popping up. Tremble before him all the earth. So the greatest obstacle to fearing God is our misplaced fears. Our king is glorious and worthy of our fear. He's worthy of us recognizing his power and placing him as the highest priority. So how do we actually cultivate this? Well, we actually see the key in verses seven through nine. There's really two things that you give to God in order to help cultivate a fear of God in your own life. And I'll try to scratch the surface with these. I can't go incredibly deep due to time, but the two things you give to God to cultivate a fear of God is your attention and your allegiance. You give God your attention and you give God your allegiance. You see here in verses seven through nine, it says ascribe multiple times. The word ascribe simply means to acknowledge. What does it say for us to acknowledge? Well, back to the theme of power. It says acknowledge his glory and acknowledge his strength. His glory is all of his works in creation that are made possible by his power or his strength. And the key here that's underneath the surface is our lives, as I've already mentioned, they go in the direction of what we give our attention to. Our lives go in the direction of what we give our attention to. Remember at the beginning when I said, we all live by the stories we believe and kids, what they do is they live by the stories they're consuming and then their play is a pretending to be the characters in these stories. One of the scary ways this happens in the lives of adults because we all know that this does happen. We may not do imaginary pretend play, but we accept a worldview and then we respond to the world with that worldview. And the scary thing, and I know this is gonna be a little bit cliche because we've heard this before, but I think it's worth saying and re-saying uh, many, many times, but the scary thing about uh, social media is that companies are getting so good at advertising that they're literally changing our behavior. They're literally changing our behavior. I remember as a kid watching TV when there was still commercials. My kids, the first time they saw a commercial, they lost it. They're like, what is this travesty? And I was like, when I remember TiVo coming out and you could record stuff and fast forward, I thought the world can't get any more technologically advanced than this. But I remember as a kid watching TV, what would happen periodically, depending on the channel? You would get an infomercial. Uh, you'd get the infomercial for the indestructible Tupperware or uh, Billy, what's his name? What's his? Billy Mays, OxyClean. OxyClean actually works, though, I'll say. <laughs> That's a good one. So I didn't, I didn't see it then, but I see it now, amen. So these infomercials, everything was always 1999 or three easy payments of 1999. 
And I remember thinking to myself, and granted, I was, you know, a kid or a teenager, and so I would always think to myself, who would buy this stuff? I don't wanna buy this stuff. I would never buy this. And honestly, what they were doing is, it was just kind of a scatter shot marketing approach. We're gonna put this on a bunch of different channels and hope somebody will buy this who their Tupperware finally failed them and somebody ran over their Tupperware of the car and they need to buy indestructible Tupperware for some reason that could survive a nuclear war. And so that's how the marketing worked. But social media is a lot different. Social media knows you and your habits so well that the ads oftentimes are so specific that they work. And I'm not gonna have you raise your hand if you've ever bought anything from an ad on social media. Uh, but I, I mean, I've had the shameful experience where I saw something, I was like, ooh, I, I was just talking about how I need this. <laughs> and I buy it, and then I'm like, oh man, they got me. They really got me. But what it's doing is it's literally changing your behavior. It's changing your behavior, and then your social media is curated to what you like, and you start, it's just like this reinforcing cycle where you like something, you see more of it, then you become more like that thing. And this is what happens, and it's changing us. So what you give your attention to is what you start to become. What you behold is who you become. And so the question is, is your life structured in such a way where God gets your attention? Because an hour a week, hearing somebody talk at you and singing songs pales in comparison to the amount of intake we have in other areas of our life, if, if we're being kind of morbid here. And the harsh reality is, if you wanna become like God, if you wanna learn to fear God, you come to him by faith alone, through grace alone, but if you wanna become like him, you've gotta give him your attention. You've gotta structure your life in such a way where God gets attention, where you start to see him and his works in creation. This was the application from last week, if you remember it. The application was catalog all of the ways you see God's greatness in your life. You can get so creative with this. You can set a reminder on your phone every hour to think about God. You could do so many different things, but here's the reality. I know so many of you feel so busy, so overwhelmed, so overworked. Where do you even start? So I wanna get really simple here. I don't wanna make this more complicated and make you feel guilty for not doing enough and all of these things because I don't think that would help you. Here's where I would start, and this is just the, uh, this is just the truth. There's nothing pretty about this. There's the, this is not really a shortcut. Cut one thing from your calendar and replace it with prayer. Delete social media for a week and replace the times that you would go on social media with prayer. And I'm not, when I say prayer, I'm not saying you gotta be talking the whole time. You could be sitting in silence thinking about God, meditating on him. Cut one thing and replace it with prayer. Whatever it is. I know if you look at your calendar, you look at how you spend your time, there is something that could be cut that you probably would be better for and you can replace it with something that, you, that is the best use of your time possible. So you give God your attention. Again, you could do 12 week series on how best to do that, so I don't have time to dive into that. That's the best I can give you right now is cut one thing, replace it with prayer. But the second thing that the king is due, other than our attention, is our allegiance. Our allegiance. So your attention is more about what you put your focus on, your mind. Your allegiance is how you use your hands, what you give to God Literally, what does it say in the passage in verse eight? It says, come into his courts and bring what? An offering, bring an offering. Yeah, you know, God doesn't ask for offerings because he needs stuff. He asks for offerings from us because he wants your heart. And what you invest in is what captures your heart. So very simply put, again, this is stuff you guys know, but it's stuff that is good to be reminded of. We all need these reminders. The key to your heart and the things we offer to God is through your calendar and through your wallet. What you give your time to is where your heart goes. What you give your resources to is where your heart goes. And again, God doesn't ask for these things because he's greedy or because he needs stuff or because he's mad at you. He asks for these things because he is a loving father who wants you to know his heart. And when you give towards him, you start to love him and then you also learn to receive his love. 
That's how we give him our allegiance. What you invest in is what you love. Why do we love our kids so much? Well, we are designed by God to have a natural connection with them, but also you spend a lot of money on them. You spend a lot of time with them. The money and time you spend on your kids leads you to love them in a way that you never imagined you could love anything, right? So it is with our other relationships. So it is with God. And here's the beautiful thing. This is not a quick fix, but if you cultivate a lifestyle of giving God your attention and your allegiance, these are small investments you make into your spiritual life that will lead to, by the end of your life, somebody who is joyful, purposeful, and confident that all that God has done and all that God will do is good. Because this psalm is telling a story that God is a glorious king, that he is do certain things from us because of his glory and his strength, and that this king is leading history towards a time when he returns and makes all things right. And if you wanna be the type of person who looks forward to his return with joyful expectation, then you give God your attention, you give God your allegiance, and then this will be your attitude starting in verse 10 when when we see the king's coming. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all that fills it. Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. We've looked at the king's glory. We've looked at the king's due. Now let's take a look at the king's coming. This Verse 10 really gives us the whole point of the psalm. It says, the Lord reigns. He is king. And he is going to come, he made the world and he established it. And he's going to come back and he's going to judge the peoples with equity. He's going to bring justice. He's going to bring order where we have made disorder. And when the Lord returns and makes all things right, what happens? All of creation is glad. All of creation is glad. You know, you realize when Adam and Eve fell, one of the results of that was God says, cursed is the ground because of you. And that's why he said to Adam, the ground is cursed because of you, so work is gonna produce sweat and it's gonna be toilsome and it's gonna be difficult. And what happened is creation, although still beautiful and although still magnificent, is under a curse because humans invited brokenness and sin into the world. And so the Bible teaches that creation is longing for its redemption. It's longing for the day when all things are made right. It's longing for the day when the Lord returns and makes everything that has been wrong and he makes it right. It's amazing, you know, Jesus in Luke 19, he's coming into the city on Palm Sunday and people are shouting Hosanna, they're worshiping him and the religious leaders of the day, they get upset and they tell Jesus, tell these people to stop worshiping you. And he says, if they didn't, the rocks would cry out. If they don't give praise, the rocks would shout. Because creation knows who the creator is. Creation knows what it's been subjected to because of the brokenness that we've invited in. And the most appropriate way to look forward to the king's return and to take the first step towards the fear of God is to understand, as people who live on the other side of the cross, is understand that this king that we've talked about is King Jesus. This king that we've been mentioning is Jesus. He is glorious. He is due our attention and allegiance. He is coming to make things right and fully establish his kingdom. For us, the fear of God begins with running to Jesus. And here's the beautiful thing. You run to him 
when things are going great and you especially run to him in your sin. It is an act of fearing God to run to Jesus in your sin because you're acknowledging that he is the only one who can properly deal with your sin. You can't atone for your own sin by being good enough. The effects of your sin will not go away by distracting yourself into oblivion. The only way to invite redemption is to bring your own sin and your own stuff and your own brokenness to Jesus as the one who is strong enough and good enough to deal with it. This fear of God produces, encourages us to run to him, not away from him. Why don't you stand with me this morning? As we prepare to respond, I wanna do something a little bit different. We've talked at length about the fear of God. We've mentioned that he's a glorious king, he is due our worship, he's due our fear, and that he's coming. The New Testament capitalizes on this theme on many different occasions, but most vividly, Paul jumps all over this in Romans chapter, Romans chapter eight where I am confident you've heard him describe what our world is coming to and going through. And Paul writes this, listen with me. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? The reality is, the king is on his way. But as we wait, our world is still broken. And you're still broken. But what that means is we can hope together in a future where the king makes everything right. And in the meantime, we can fear him now, know his power, place him as our top priority so that we can look forward to his return later. I'm gonna pray for us and when I'm done praying, I wanna give you the chance to respond. Two simple questions I want you to ask yourself. What is God saying to me? And what am I gonna do about it? I wanna invite our prayer team up. This is a great opportunity to bring to God anything that, you, that is stealing your attention or your allegiance. It's a great opportunity for you to confess to a prayer team member or to seek help through prayer. This is also a great chance for you simply to sing and declare the truth of this song, Jesus Over Everything, which captures the theme of all that we've discussed. Let's pray together. Father, you are a good and glorious king. Your son Jesus has opened up a door for us to experience redemption, to experience wholeness and newness. And I pray, Father, that you would allow us to cultivate a fear of you that draws us close rather than makes us run away. We know that no sin is too big for the grace of God and that Jesus himself is the only one strong enough to deal with our own brokenness. So I pray this morning that you would invite people into a relationship with Jesus, that those who maybe have been struggling would start fresh today and devote their attention and allegiance to him. 
We pray that you do what only you can do, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like to dig deeper into this message, you can access the discussion guide right where you found this message, either on the website or over at the Center Grove app. Also, head to cglife.org to learn more about Center Grove, what we're up to, and how to access even more resources. Thanks again for opening God's Word with us today. We hope that you've been encouraged and challenged to walk deeper in relationship with Him.